Welcome to the first and hopefully not necessarily the precedent-setting attendance of <laughs> the, uh, what is this series called? Stories, Songs, and Laughter. Uh, my name is Ian Brody. For those who don't know me, which might be just you, um, and uh, I, I have been here for the better part of uh, 18 or 19 years now. And uh, one of my areas happens to be the study of comedy and particularly in the past few years, the study of Cape Breton comedy. And so when the series was suggested, hey, why don't you bring some local person in? The first person I thought of was our esteemed guest, Mr. Clifton Cremo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks for thanks for thinking of me first. Yeah. There are I mean, plenty uh, of other better options who would fill these seats. Really? Name seven. Name seven? Nick Beaton. Okay, he's never in town. Ron James. But he's never in town, and I don't think he likes me anymore. <laughs> uh, Jimmy Rankin. Not a comedian, but... Not a comedian. Hmm. Dom Monroe. <laughs> My best friend. Okay, we're going to stop. Well, this is serious. Uh, I, have a, I have a personal agenda for wanting to interview Clifton, but um, uh, because, as I said, I'm interested in this sort of trajectory of recorded comedy in Cape Breton prof and professional comedy in particular, starting from like the sitcoms um, uh, in the 1930s, the Cotters sitcom uh, right, that CJCB did all the way through Dishpan Parade and uh, to, then to Summertime Review and uh, then to uh, Magic Ranch and Clifton. And I think there's an interesting presence about what happens when you have a, a fairly distinct place, enough that they have a center for its study, Cape Breton, no less and uh, a history of performance that's there, but what happens when it be enters into uh, a marketplace? What happens when it is hopefully at least going to extend past the borders uh, of the island and turn into something professional? How does that comedy get changed over time? So I want to get started with you and basically ask you what your life prior to being a comedian, what was what was your performance life like or, or, or your... What was you? Were you funny? Were Were, were I funny? Were uh, Were you funny? I I'd say yeah. Conversationally, I was I was I was decently funny. Okay. Um, I I wasn't really a performance kind of person. Okay. Um, no school plays or no school plays. Uh, my school didn't have much in yeah. in Escazoni. I don't know. I don't know. Like, we didn't have a cafeteria. Like, because Escazoni is a small community. Everyone, yeah. all the kids just got bussed home for lunch. But like my my partner was mentioning earlier, like oh, this reminds me of grade school because we were eating at Harris Hall, yeah. and I was like, how this oh. is this is university? Like I, I didn't have a chocolate milk dispenser until until I paid you know ten grand in tuition for it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you don't get a chocolate milk dispenser in elementary school. Okay, you have one of the other grade three students deliver a little carton of milk. Right, to your class. but I mean beyond school, there's community. Were there any sort of performance um, type so things there? Or? I, I guess there were like opportunities for performance. It was never really me. I, when I was 16, I was in Mr. Escazoni, which is like a uh, beauty pageant. It's it, it's it's kind of like a, a little riff and fun play on. We have the princess pageant during the winter carnival in Escazoni, okay. and it's kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the Mr. Escazoni is more just like a gag. Like okay. we we did a thing where like you know we the cuties contest where all the guys dressed as girls and like who was the cutest girl okay. kind of thing. Um, so, so deeply I, enlightened comedy. Deeply enlightened comedy. Okay. And uh, I, I, I took part in that. It was just, you know, something yeah. for the teenagers to do, and it was it was fun. Um, that would be – and then you have, like, the talent portion of it. Didn't do comedy for my talent because I did not have an inkling that it, that was what I would be doing. Okay. I did uh, choreographed dance for my for my talent. Okay. Um, I think I am a little better at comedy than – Okay. Choreographed dance, though. All right. So what? So you know what impelled you eventually to actually give it a try? Um, so up. I've yeah, I've never been like afraid of public speaking. Uh, that that's another thing. Like most of the work that I've done pre prior to comedy has been in the school or uh, like through an organization, kind of delivering workshops like in classrooms. So like I've always and my mom is a teacher and like uh, so I've always just been kind of comfortable talking in front of groups of people. So that that didn't really intimidate me at all. Uh, and how I got into it was there was an uh, – when I was about uh, – okay, this is early life performance. I went to uh, 
here at CBU actually, I went to drama camp, uh, like an improv camp at okay. the at the Boardmore with uh, Brian Gallivan, I believe, mm-hmm. ran it. And uh, one of the, I don't know, improv camp counselors was James F.W. Thompson. Okay. And uh, he, something I've always appreciated uh, and being someone who has worked in the schools and stuff like that with with youth um when you're when you're 12 years old in a drama camp and there's a university age person who doesn't treat you like you're annoying for being 12 right and they they treat you like a person it like does impact you mm-hmm. so uh yeah I like i always thought james was cool and that all the other counselors that were there were, were were really cool and nice people so i was like you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna Try to reconnect with James. I'm going to creep him on Facebook. Okay. So I creeped him on Facebook, and I was going to send him a message to just be like, hey, I don't know if you remember. I was yeah. a kid in drama camp. And then I saw on his Facebook wall that he was doing an open mic at Daniel's, uh, which is a bar in Sydney. And I was like, you know what? Screw the message. I'm just going to go in person. Yeah. And when I went in person, I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try to impress him <laughs> by trying comedy. Okay. And that was, I, that was I just, it. Yeah, I went for it. Yeah, and I, I, I believe I was there that night. I, I think and you were. I'm like, oh, there's this kid who wants to try it. Like, oh, yeah, okay, what's going on? And then you embarrassed us by being so good, which is very <laughs> frustrating. And I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not here to serve sh- shovel compliments at you, but it, it, was, it was kind of remarkable. And then, um, but, you know, did, did, well, I guess, first, did you impress James? I have no idea. Uh, did you ever talk to him? I, I, I talked to him, uh, but I, and I don't know if I impressed him that night. Okay. But... Uh, He's very supportive of, okay. you know, where I'm at now. And, like, anytime I have a show or whatever, whenever I run into him, he's just like, it's amazing what you're doing. And, <laughs> and yeah, that makes me happy. And does he remember the uh, – does he remember you from improv camp? Yeah, I think so. Okay. And and did you remind him of that story at least? Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. Uh, but what um, uh, what kind of uh, material – do, are you attracted to both as a consumer and then the, what you want to actually do on stage? Because as, okay, so they're they're very different. Uh, as a consumer, I I do really appreciate like a, a short one liner, kind of like a Stephen Wright or a Mitch Hedberg, mm-hmm. uh, kind of the Kings or a Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah, uh, I, I really appreciate that style of writing because it's like uh, one of the things you learn when you're doing comedy is you want to trim the fat, trim the fat. And when you can trim it down to like basically a single line mm-hmm. and have a good joke, that's very, very impressive to me. Mm-hmm. And some people's brains just work that way. I don't think mine really does. I'm, I'm more of a storyteller. So that would be the biggest difference is like when I consume, I like almost short form one-liners. And when I when I perform, I, I am still set up punch, but I'm not – and it like, but it is a bit more long-winded, I'd say. Well, it's rooted in story. Yeah, it's, it's 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 rooted in story. Uh, like most things I say on stage are are true or at least based in truth. Um, I don't like if I'm telling you like, oh, the other day I went to the store and this happened. I didn't just invent that. Yeah, like I did go to the store and something very similar to that happened. Right. Yeah. Now it might not have been the other day. It might have been three years yeah, previously. Yeah, yeah. In comedy, the other day is yeah. all encompassing. Aforementioned moment in time. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, how how do you judge reaction from an audience beyond laughter? I mean, because obviously laughter is is, is the, the fundamental measurement of, of success. But when you start dealing with material that might be make people uncomfortable, I've seen I've I've seen how you play with discomfort. Okay, which is really kind of interesting, and you and you have that now in your routine where you begin with the sort of the the invocation in Migma. Mm-hmm. And it's all about basically making people like me feel guilty. Yeah, yeah, that that that's that's part of it. Uh, making making people feel guilty. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm, the goal is to make people feel guilty. No, it's, but it, it's it's to play it's, with it though. Yeah, it's to yeah. it's to build a little tension, yeah. and then to release that tension so that you know that I'm not serious. Yeah, exactly. like 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 obviously if I'm dealing with a touchy subject or whatever, um, people get on edge, and that that's how I would judge it. Is like people's attention whether like the laugh at the end is always the the goal and mm-hmm. that's that's the best feedback is the laugh at the end but like when you're when you're building the tension or when you're you're doing the setup to uh, when you can tell that they're actually listening 
Yeah. You know, especially if it's like a longer setup or if you're explaining something like, uh, I've got a joke that would be dated now that's a, a, like about the lobster fishery and the whole thing with the Mi'kmaq moderate livelihood. Um, so if I were to perform that joke now, I might have to remind people mm-hmm. what that's about and that might make people uncomfortable. But as long as they're, yeah. as long as I can tell they're listening, then I know that they'll be there when the punch comes. Yeah. But the, and the reminding people, unfortunately, then adds that, uh, it's the opposite of, of cutting the fat. It's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So material must have a shelf life. Yeah. Material does have a shelf life, especially like if you're do- dealing with news stories and, and stuff like that. Um, it also just has a shelf life personally. Like sometimes you just get oh, yeah. tired of a joke. Yeah. Um, and like, like I have some, some merch that was designed by my, my partner, uh, that I, that I sell at shows, but it's like referencing material. And then I'm like, oh man, to sell the merch, I have to do that joke. Yeah. Because <laughs> other, who's going to buy a lobster with my face on it unless I do the lobster joke? Yeah. Right. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and then that I'm not allowed to wear that shirt because it terrifies certain people. <laughs> no. it, it's a lovely design. It's also kind of a frightening design. Um, I like this idea of tension, though. Do, mm-hmm. I mean, so do you? Is your sort of basic theory of comedy about tension and release? Tension and release. Yeah, generally, I'd say uh, tension and release. Um, yeah, I, I think that's that's literally what comedy is. I, I, I think you you build a tension and then you release it, and if you release it the right way, it gets the right reaction. And, and can you name a circumstance where you released it the wrong way? Ooh, a circumstance where I released it the wrong way. I mean, or are you just so good at your job? I'm I'm pretty good at my <laughs> job, but like. I, I, you definitely bomb every 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 now and then, no matter how good uh, you could be. You could be Bill mm-hmm. Burr. You could, you yeah. Know, you, it it won't. It, it's not always going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, I I've I've got a few bombing stories. Uh, I'd say um, most recently I did a, I did a taping, and uh, I f- I switched my set at the last minute because my set was too long. Okay. And then I was like, okay, I'll just cut my ending and I'll throw some new jokes in the middle. Uh, for a TV taping, you should when, when you're throwing new jokes in the middle, they should be jokes that you've practiced, not literally new jokes. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. Okay. And then I was just like, uh, how does this one go? What? On, on television. Yeah. <laughs> they can edit that out, thankfully. But it was not, not great. But the, not but the room is still there. Yeah, the room is still there. Uh, they think it's kind of endearing when something like that happens, though. Like, literally the set before mine at that taping, uh, a guy did an act out where he ran off the stage and he obliterated the set. Okay. And the, the, the audience wasn't there. Like, they, they, they just weren't energized until he did that. Okay. So sometimes, sometimes yeah. you know, people enjoy the, like, the reason a lot of comics do crowd work is because people are going to enjoy the personalized stuff that no other show is going to get, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's special to them. I went to a show one time with my friend, and uh, I wasn't performing, but we were just watching the show, and she burped, and then the, the the comic just laid into her. Yeah. And it was very memorable. Like, I don't remember anyone else's joke from that night, but because it pertained to me and my friend, uh, it was funny and memorable. I was at a show the other week, and uh, it just went into a complete meltdown where someone in the audience basically was sitting almost the equivalent of like right here, wasn't laughing. The comedian pointed it out and basically said, you're not funny, you called me a homophobe. And they went on for like 10 minutes and security had to come and haul them out. And it was just a remarkable exercise in what happens when things go horribly, horribly wrong. But, you know, the, man, the guy managed to recover, so it was kind of fascinating once, yeah. the, once the dude was kicked out. So if you have this notion of tension, though, what, what are the themes that you like to introduce that are tense that then become released through the comic snap. Uh, most of the tense themes are, are going to be like about indigenous issues and stuff like that. Uh, okay. With the, like the lobster joke that I mentioned was with the moderate livelihood fishery, which was a very hot topic and very contentious between you know non-native fishermen and native fishermen and yeah. uh, jealousy and anger and all that like all that stuff coming out. So it's something something to navigate. You anytime you basically have. Uh, something that's on one side or the other, it's going to yeah. make some tension with the other side. Uh, like I, I, I have some jokes that are about residential school and stuff like that, which is definitely a touchy subject. I've seen, I, I, I know people who have gotten canceled. I mean, 
as, as much as you can be canceled in Canadian comedy because you yeah. don't really have anything to lose. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, for jokes they made about residential school that weren't even that that were still like punching down on the Catholic Church and not the not the victims. Right. Um, but people are like, that's not your place to say you, even though you're, you know, making a joke against the Catholic Church you're white, so you can't talk about this subject. And I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, mm-hmm. but uh, it it does, you know, because I am indigenous, like, people are going to be more lenient, at mm-hmm. least, and uh, my takes on the subject are, like, very pro-victim mm-hmm. and anti, yeah. you know. So it's like, I don't think... I'm going to get in trouble <laughs> no. for, for, for what I'm saying because what I'm saying is yeah. good in my, in my opinion. Right. But on, on top of that, there's, there's obviously, I mean, you can sort of think of various indigenous issues and there's like the hot button ones in terms of mm-hmm. uh, the school. But one of the things I've always liked about what you do is the sort of much more mundane ethnographic, like sort of life on the res mm-hmm. sort of things. I mean, you know, the, the, like your description earlier about the the absence of the uh, chocolate milk dispenser mm-hmm. and so on, and and the description of like the thin house, the thin walls in the houses and so on. Mm-hmm. So a lot, uh, the I think that there is um, this interesting insight into a culture that colonized colonizer people don't get to see too often yeah um and it's not threatening Mm -hmm. it's not and it's not fraught with tension it's just like other we go oh Mm -hmm. okay and yeah yeah so it's very approachable but still just there's a frisson tension there yeah and i i i do like that about about uh not just my own comedy, but like generally whenever I see it, like a, another indigenous comic in the country who's very good is Chad Anderson. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's based in Winnipeg and he's, he, he's an indigenous comic, but it's not all, all the, the same, it's right. not all the same stuff. And it's, it's not like, uh, I, I do think there is very good to be, uh, I do think it's very good to paint the picture of, what it's like to be an indigenous person in the modern age, uh, because what you see in the media is either, uh, you know, the drunken Indian or how, yeah. you know, like, or like, uh, this, like, we're not all residential schools. Uh, it, yeah. We're not all drunks. We're not like the, we're normal people. And for people to see that and just like to, to shine a light on, the slight differences of, of what it what it's like to to have been raised uh, Mi'kmaq or indigenous, yeah. um, it, to paint the realistic picture of what it's like, yeah, is is good. And also that it's not all defined by trauma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it definitely not all defined by trauma? Um, there 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 is trauma, and there there's a lot of there's a lot of that stuff. But like, um, it's not who we are, and I'd say who we are is how we how we overcome that. And like, you know, you, you hear all the time about indigenous people, like, uh, we're storytellers, but we also have a very good sense of humor and like, you have to be able to laugh at the traumas that we've endured or mm-hmm. else, or else it'll consume you. And I think there is truth in that. Yeah. Um, not always laughing, but like, uh, like working through something, working yeah. through something, however you do it, uh, there's strength in that. There is, but one of the things that I sometimes push back at in in, in in moments like this is the idea that that is what the comedy is for, and that comedy that doesn't have some kind of like underlying social message or um, uh, purpose behind it is somehow misdirected in a way. And I, I you feel that a lot in discussions of diversity and inclusion. It's like we need other voices because other voices need to sort of speak to their traumas in the public stage. It's like maybe other voices also just want to be funny as yeah. well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and like, yeah, comedy doesn't always have to have an underlying message. Like I mentioned m- what my favorites being like Stephen Wright and Mitch Hedberg. Like yeah. there is no, <laughs> there's no underlying message. There's no theme of trauma in, mm-hmm. you know, when you want to eat so two thousand of something you eat right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah um but but i I think and this is not particular to stand up, I think it's particular to the notion of the comic in that we momentarily 
forget that its purpose is fundamentally joyful. Mm-hmm. We, and instead, we turn to it as some kind of like, uh, it needs to have some um, rhetorical heft and some sociological heft. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, that's always something that, that I, I find myself in tension with. Because when you talk to actual comics, yeah, some of them do want to do stuff. And some of them, or, yeah, and, and some of them, that is, is precisely why they are there. But others, that might be a vehicle for the laugh. That might be something that, a, a path that they can take towards a laugh. But laughs that they take through other paths are equally as valid. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's interesting. Um, which made me think of a point, and then I bored myself with my own conversation, and now I blocked that point. Um, oh, right. But speaking of which, now you have a you have a reputation, a national reputation. So um, it's not simply on on island. Uh, I don't think anyone could be a professional comedian and not cross the canso at any given moment. I mean, you'd be surprised, but <laughs> I, I could you. I, 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 I mean, not, I'm not saying you, know, you you need to move away, but you need to tour. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. definitely, you definitely need a tour. Um, you you need to get the outside perspectives. Like if you if you just stay in Cape Breton, you're yeah. you're you're not going to know what people in others th- like. I've had this this belief that like I think I can do well in almost any city in the country, but I think if like a, a Toronto comic who's only ever done Toronto came here, they would almost definitely bomb. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Um, so I think there is something to be said about about you know, being from a small town and branching out as opposed to being from a big city or being from a, a major hub and then branching out from there. Uh, it's literally two yeah. different directions. But how do you adapt your material when you go other I, places? I generally don't. No? I, 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 my material, I, when, I do, when I write it, I try to keep it as, as baseline and every man as possible. Okay. Um, I, I try to, like... I try to make sure, th- and this is this is going to sound bad, like me me shitting on Cape Breton audiences, but I try to make sure that everything is understandable enough for people in Cape Breton. Like like in in a in a bigger city, I'm, I'm not I'm not. I want to watch you dig dig yourself out of this hole. No, here no. in the center for Cape Breton studies. Yeah, in, in no, but I think I think in a smaller town you're going to. Uh, be more disconnected from, from stuff in bigger cities. Like I, I'd say, I, I have jokes about being on Tinder or whatever. And I think Tinder is going to be less prevalent here. Be, and the joke that I make is like, when you're from a small place, you're related to everybody on Tinder, right? So people are going to use it less here because of that. So you can't talk about how you're like, I don't think a joke about how your Tinder gold subscription is going to land as well here as it might in Toronto where a lot of people are trying to use Tinder Gold. Gotcha. So, like, you, you know, if you speak in generalities about Tinder. So you're you speaking, you modify your material for Cape Breton. You don't really modify your material for outside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd say that's that's true. And, like like I said, I'm not, I'm not trying to – I'm just saying that there are, there are different um, focuses that people have here yeah. compared to elsewhere. Yeah. Exactly, different touchstones. So, yeah. very interesting. Uh, but uh, now, I, you discussed this briefly with me at one point. Now you find yourself as uh, sort of a, a capital I, or sorry, cap- capital F, capital N, First Nations entertainer, and you're often in, in like flown out to Ottawa to do shows and things. What is it like being a comedian on a uh, variety show or variety style performance where you are with other artists? Um, it can be great and it can be good. Uh, I'd say from uh, great to good, from great to good. That's can, a, that's a... Uh, but like when I say good, I mean like, I mean, good. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's definitely never bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially like I did a show in Ottawa where it was a, like a corporate event, um, uh, for this first nations organization. And the entertainment was a drag queen and myself. Okay. And, I can't follow a drag queen. No. Like, but I had to, and it was awful. It not, like, the show itself was good. Like, the people in the audience enjoyed the drag queen, they enjoyed me, but how am I supposed to compete with someone taking their clothes off and dancing around the room individually and, like, uh, I, like I, 
I just went up on and I, the first thing I said was like, I, I'm going to disappoint you because the shirt is staying on mm-hmm. and I'm not leaving the stage. <laughs> yeah. On the, on the flip side, you know, um, I did a show last night here in Cape Breton that was uh, all about, you know, the, the rising talent and it was a music show, mm-hmm. but I was the host. So I got to do a little bit of comedy and then introduce everybody. And that was fantastic. It was, it was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think because I didn't have to follow them, I introduced them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the, there's always something to be said about the the order of a lineup. You want to curate that as best you can. Um, you told me once that you were on a similar program where you sort of had to follow a children's choir who were presenting uh, songs, you know, in, yeah. re- in, in in praise of survivors of the residential schools. Yeah, and, yeah, that and <laughs> that's another aspect of it where they they you know. Uh, the the grade six the grade six community class has done uh uh they they have written a song about the missing and murdered indigenous women yeah and it's just like everyone's crying and then yeah. and then I have to go up and it's like what well, talk about my butthole like yeah <laughs> exactly how do you make that switch yeah so um uh so do, so are you are you asked and are you being are you tired of being asked questions like what is the the function or the role of stand up um not really i don't nobody's ever asked no one's ever asked no, 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 one's, no one's, one's ever asked, asked. everyone asks how i get started and, yeah. and that that kind of thing but nobody's ever asked about like yeah. the the role of stand up i mean how does it fit i mean how do you sort of what do you think that you are doing i think uh, i'm i'm providing entertainment for people okay. uh like some comics will say, like, you know, uh, they're trying to remove you from the world. Like, you, for the two hours, the 90 minutes you're in a show, you're not thinking about the, the daily stresses you have. You're just thinking about what's being said. But frankly, I don't believe that because, you know, you come in and a comic is just going to talk about their own version of the stresses that you have. Yeah, They're like, money, right? Money is tight. Oh, man, I'm so poor. And then that gets you thinking about what's going like your financial situation. So I don't necessarily think you're removing uh, people from their lives. I, I, I just think you're providing an entertaining spin on it so that not only do they enjoy themselves while they're there, they might have a new perspective on their own stuff mm-hmm. when they when they walk away. Yeah. What do you think a connection is between a comedian and an audience? Ooh, connection between a comedian and an audience. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the connection is because, like, there, there are some people – I know whenever I perform my intro, uh, you, you mentioned earlier, I, I introduce myself in Mi'kmaq. Uh, that establishes who I am, uh, not only, like, I'm Clifton, um, but also, like, who I am as a indigenous – like, it identifies myself as an indigenous person and it, like – I, I always start my sets with an introduction to me so that we can build that right. rapport. And like I, in a room like this, I could obviously, I know most people and if the ones that I don't know, I can ask, yeah. uh, but you can't do that at every show, obviously. Yeah. So, um, you're, when you're connecting with an audience, you're, uh, you're having, you're doing a monologue, but you, you have to make it feel like a dialogue. Yeah. Um, and the only way you can do that is by, you know, letting people connect with you on a personal level, I think. I, I think if you're, um, if you just go straight into business, like if you went to see a comedian and they started with knock, knock, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to be like, what the hell is this guy doing? Right. <laughs> right. I can get a knock, knock joke from my four year old. Uh, or like if they go straight into politics, you're like, I thought I was coming to a comedy show or, yeah. what, you know, I think you, you do have to build that personal connection to an audience. And then I think uh, another big thing is just being able to connect with, connect, connect after. Once you reach a certain point of like success or fame, when you have, when you're selling out theaters of, you know, 8,000 people or whatever, you obviously can't really hang around after the show and meet people. Right. But when you're performing to, you know, 50 people in a bar, mm-hmm. uh, making yourself available and just talking to people, answering questions, uh, you know, builds, builds a rapport and they, they'll want to come back to the guy that, was friendly and nice to them yeah. as opposed to going back to see the guy that they didn't interact with at all. Yeah. Well, friendly and nice for them, but it was also funny on stage. Yeah. Yeah. And so you bring, bring, back, uh, bring that back. Yeah. I mean, and so I'm, uh, that that's one of the things I'm always interested in, in that how much of the comedian's job 
is establishing a reputation for being funny in addition to being funny and establishing so that uh, for you know having a good time so that people will come participating in interviews having social media a, a, a particular presence because you, you have a you, you have your professional Facebook page mm -hmm. you have Instagram and so on so how much of that is about you know creating the Clifton Cremo uh, there's definitely I think everyone now with social media has a curated online presence. Yeah. Uh, I think when you're in a professional performance, uh, when you're in like the public entertainment sector, you do have to curate a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. um, not that my social media game is any good. Like I'm, I, you know, I don't do well on social media. And it, that's, I mean, if you want to talk, you know, how comedy is, like the state of comedy and stuff like that and how it's shifting, I'd say with the uh, prevalence of TikTok and like, all that stuff, a lot of comedy bookers and a lot of uh, like festivals and all that stuff are looking at your following. Now. Yeah. Like, like you can be funny as hell if you have 200 followers versus someone who's mediocre, who has 2 million. Yeah. They're booking the 2 million guy because that's going to sell tickets. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you, you see a lot of people making the switch uh, and not to, not to diss every TikTok comedian, but like there are some people who, do well on TikTok by stitching videos, then they think, oh, I'm funny. And then yeah. they book a stand-up comedy tour where they blabber on stage not saying anything funny for an hour. Yeah. And then they've burned everyone who showed up to that show. They don't want to come again. Mm -hmm. um, so that you, you do have to work hard on making sure your act is funny. That, that's first and foremost, in my opinion, uh, before your social media and your following and your, your making clips and all that stuff. Um, like myself, I have not many followers. Like my professional Facebook page has 400, I think. Mm. Um, and you know, my personal has like 1200. Uh, I, I don't get more than like 30 likes on any given post, especially there's something that the algorithm, the algorithm hates, uh, promotion. Because okay. all of the like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, all of them are trying to sell ad space. Mm -hmm. So if you say, come to my performance at 1 p.m., you know, because you didn't buy an ad, they're going to they, they shove it down, shove it down, okay. shove it down hard. Um, so like when, especially when you're like a budding comic, or even if you're a professional working comic, you probably don't have that much money to spend on ads. No. Honestly. Um yeah, so you you have to you have to work double hard to make sure that the product that you are putting out for the people that show up mm -hmm. is enjoyable enough for them to tell someone else and okay. bring yeah. them back. So at the begin, so at the beginning of a show, you, you do your introduction, and it's one of the things you said is sort of, you know, you 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 could be understood as a, as representative of a category, and so it's like this is me. I'm a First Nations man. This is what we have to talk about. Is it a way of sort of getting it? Out of the way, yeah. so that you can now say, "All right, you know what? It's the, like that thing in Amistad. You know what I am, but I, you don't know who I am mm -hmm. at, at this point." So is that? Um, but how do you think the relationship to the audience is different by the end of the show, whether or not there's a meet or greet afterwards? Um, by the end of the show, like so, generally, I do I do start with the the introduction to who I am and mm -hmm. and all that stuff. I get that out of the way. Um, if I have, if I'm doing in that set jokes about like the divisive issues yeah. or whatever, I also kind of front load those and then I just have fun towards the end. So like I always try to, uh, start a set off and it's a good general rule in comedy to start it off clean mm -hmm. and then work dirtier and dirtier because the audience will get more comfortable with you. Yeah. Uh, if you, if you, if a stranger came up to you and started talking about their genitalia, you'd be weirded out. Right. But if, you know, your best friend brought it up, you'd, you'd be like, okay, we can talk about this. So you, you build that rapport. Yeah. Right. And to, I don't like before, where this conversation is going. Hey, hey, <laughs> we've been talking for a while now. Not, I'm going to bust it out. Now it's done. I'm going to whip We're it out. We're all friends here. <laughs> yeah. No, but yeah, you, you build up and then, um, you, you get more intimate as the show goes on. You, you let people in with a bit more detail. Uh, you, you start off, you, you know, I, I have jokes um, like about my partner or whatever that they, they generally go towards the end um, 
because I've uh, like I'm letting you more into my life. Like mm-hmm. you know, you know Clifton. You know he's from Escazoni. Yeah, you don't know much else. But then then you find out, you know, like I have a I have a partner and I'm living with them. And then mm-hmm. and then you're like you're building this this bigger picture of of who I am and and you know at by the end I think I think you feel like you know me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, 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 as I mentioned earlier, like most of the stuff that I'm saying on stage are, are, are at least mostly based in truth. Yeah. So you are getting a picture of who I am. I'm not, I'm not mm-hmm. someone completely different off stage. I don't think. Right. So you've got, the, I get, you sort of have these two strategies. One is the release that comes you, you introduce tension and there's a release and so but both that's the strategy of what it what comprises a joke but also the strategy of i'm going to introduce a topic but because this is safe it can be released in a way that that provides laughter as opposed to provides that, that other aspect yeah and then as so as such i am getting to know you more and more over the course of the performance mm-hmm. and and by the time by the end we are you know th- you know, uh, what do they call it? Parasocially, perhaps. But, you know, the person in the audience is now your friend or considers you a friend. Yeah. Is that directed for towards the next show? Is it directed towards now you know who I am, you will come back, and so on? That, how, do, how do you cultivate a reputation? How do I cultivate a uh, – I have no idea. Just consistency, I guess. Consistency. I, I, I would say, um, in fact, I, I do try to – warn people that like if you come see me again it's largely going to be a lot of the same material um because he like you can only write at such a pace and you can only so like when i i tried to perform in cape breton not very often yeah uh just because you know we have a limited audience here and if they show up and i'm telling the same lobster joke every time Mm -hmm. nobody's gonna want to show up anymore they'll be like "I've, i've i've heard the lobster joke and i heard it three times i mean this guy this yeah. guy's a hack he doesn't have any any material um which isn't true i do mm-hmm. have i do have some material but like to to speak for an hour you're yeah. gonna have to cover a lot of the same stuff every time right exactly. uh, the 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 classics yeah. i guess but i'd say yeah i'd say consistency is is just just how you you cultivate the audience if 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 you guys came to my show and you had a good time and then you sent your friends and then the quality of the show was the same level, they would have a good time, theoretically. Yeah. And then it might just, you just get more and more people spreading by word of mouth. Okay. They're not all going to come every time. Obviously, people can't yeah. always come. But uh, if you get new people and you get good word of mouth, there's no reason it can't continue forever. Yeah. What other opportunities have come your way from this? Um. What other opportunities have come my way? I mean, outside of stand-up or, or like, stand-up opportunities? Answer either way. I think both are. Okay. Um, so, okay, here, here's, here's a decent example. I was uh, – our, our friend Joel Inglis mm-hmm. uh, sent me a message a couple of years ago, and he was like, hey, M- Matt Wright, uh, two-time Juno losing comedian, <laughs> uh, is, is – coming to Inverness and he needs an opener, uh, would you want to do it? And I was like, sure, I'll, I'll do it. And then because, you know, he was a Juno nominated comic at the time and, you know, this was like a big deal Yeah, opening, opening for Matt Wright. And it still is a big deal. He's, he's still yeah. fantastic. He, he opened for Jerry Seinfeld last year. Um, he, I, I decided I was going to film my set. So I filmed the set and it, it, it went well. Like I, I, I did well. And then, um, there was a there was a news story in the paper for some reason or another about about me. Okay. And then the Halifax Comedy Fest people reached out. And then they were like, "Hey, we we saw this story about you. Do you have any tape?" And I well, it just so happens I do because mm-hmm. I I did this show with Matt Wright. So I sent them the tape and then they were like, "Perfect. This is exactly what we what we're looking for." So I got hired for the Halifax Comedy Fest. Um so yeah, that that one show and that like Joel asking me to open. Right. You know, led to television, which leads to more, like, I did JFL, and they, you know, they, they would have discovered me through, like, Halifax Comedy Fest and stuff. Okay. Um, yeah. Rest in peace, JFL. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and what about sort of non-pure stand-up 
things? Non non pure stand up things. I've I've been. Uh, I mean, like hosting, for example, like last yeah, night. Yeah, hosting, I mean, hosting. You're a local celebrity now, who's <laughs> drawn in to do these sorts of things. I I still don't feel like a local no. celebrity, obviously. Um, one time I was at Walmart though, and some lady asked me for a selfie. So that was wow. That was you've made it. That, <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a pretty. Okay. That was a pretty big moment. Yeah. I mean, she might have just been cuckoo. <laughs> yeah. But. Um, but a couple of years ago, I saw you in the videos that, um, I'm already blanking on his last name, Jeff at the, uh, at the member two. Uh, Jeff Ward. Jeff Ward was making and sort of, and so. Yeah, yeah. We, he was doing a show, um, I think it was called Reconciliation, and it was, each episode covered a different topic, and uh, our episode was a, about, oh, God, what was our episode about? I know what it was about. I just can't think of the word. Okay. Um, but it, basically like r racism that you would encounter. Um, and yeah, we, we had a good discussion about that. Um, but I mean, that's not something that's necessarily done in a comic voice. Yeah, don't, no, definitely. Like I was right. not funny at all in that. Right. Like, if, 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 you, if you're like, oh, Clifton Cremo, if, if, this is your, if, you, if you're watching this and you're like, I wonder what this guy's comedy is like, and then you see that episode of Reconciliation... You're not going to be happy. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it, but I mean, it's one of those interesting dynamics of stand up, and or or the, uh, the 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 what happens when someone becomes known from stand up. It's like, well, this person can talk about this on on stage. I want to know more. This person is representative of a place. What are their experiences? And so mm -hmm. it's like, okay, now stand up has to be serious for a little while. Yeah, yeah. And are you comfortable doing that? Or yeah, I'm comfortable. I'm I'm comfortable doing that. Uh, I, I I think. Is it like an extension of the teaching and, and workshops that you've done before? Yeah, or? yeah, I think so. Like I, I, I was going to bring that up where I got hired to do an event. They wanted me to do comedy, but they also wanted – they were like, hey, can we hire you for a – to do a speech on he, indigenous humor and resilience. Okay. And I was like, I can try. Yeah. So, so basically I just did my set with like a little 10 minutes at the end about, you mm -hmm. know – about the set and like kind of Q and A kind of thing. Okay. Um, but yeah, it was it was pretty intimidating to be to be like, okay, it, am I going to be too funny? Am I going to be too serious? Like, I have to I have to yeah walk this walk this line. And is it a show with a little speech at the end, or is it a speech with a big show at the beginning? I mean, what is the yeah what is the frame of the event? Because they're two very different speech acts: mm -hmm. giving, giving a talk and giving a stand up performance. Mm -hmm. With different sets of expectations, like what time of the day was it? Were people allowed to drink during the seminar? All yeah, those yeah, they they weren't drinking, it was, but it was the evening at least. Okay. Um, one of the things that I'm looking to do now that I'm you know doing comedy full time, uh, there's honestly not much money in full time comedy, mm. so I'm trying to branch out and like I'm I'm developing a workshop right now that is kind of like what they hired me to do, like kind of like a, mm -hmm. but I, w I want it to be like a guided, find your own funny, like not necessarily, I'm not necessarily selling my performance. Yeah. I want to help people tell their own stories so that, you know, maybe we get more indigenous comics out of it. Maybe we get more nor like non-indigenous comics or, or like, you know, people just learning the craft uh, who don't have an in mm -hmm. to learn the craft. What's the strangest venue that you have performed in? Strangest venue. And you can define that however you wish. Hmm. I, I, I don't know if there have been, off the top of my head, any, any really strange strange venues i've uh were, were there any that sort of like the, the the context just didn't seem to fit with the performance that you were expected to give uh, corporate gigs could be like that um you know, yeah corporate gigs you're you're you know in a hotel ballroom or something and it's yeah perfectly well lit and you know sometimes you don't have a stage and they they expect you to the only microphone is behind a podium yeah or, or whatever and it, you have to stay still and that that's not I don't move very much on stage, but like being blocked by a podium is is definitely weird. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did a I did a the uh, I always describe this as my first ever bomb. I did a corporate gig uh, at the Lakes in Benyon in the big 
they have this big room okay. and like just it, it's not designed for sound and it was a Christmas party corporate gig. So everyone there didn't give a shit about what I had to say. They just yeah. wanted to drink with their coworkers. Right. So like I was just talking to nobody and like where there would normally be laughs, there were none because nobody was listening. Mm-hmm. So I was just like kind of standing there awkwardly, like where there should be laughs, I was just drinking. Yeah. <laughs> Because it would be normally where I would pause to take a drink, but because nobody was laughing, yeah. it was just me standing awkwardly I, on stage. I'm just thirsty now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, you've started uh, writing for the Sour's 22 Minutes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that would be another opportunity that came through stand-up. Um, it was always something that I like wanted to, like, it was an aspiration yeah. to, to get to write comedy for television, whether it was 22 Minutes or not, but, like, 22 Minutes kind of being the flagship Canadian comedy show yeah. uh, was was always a goal. And, like, literally I wrote a grant in September because I wanted to take classes in television writing so that I could work towards that goal someday. Mm-hmm. Uh, but because of my reputation in stand-up, they just they sent me an email. And then they were like, hey, you know, do, do you want to come work for us? And I was like, absolutely, when? And they were like, tomorrow. And I was like, uh Give me a couple of months. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. I guess most comics do have the time to just drop. <laughs> Maybe. And, and, yeah. and do tomorrow. But I was still working full time. So I was like, I have to is give that, them some notice. And Is that one of the things that incentivized you to move to full-time comedy? It, it, was, it was always the plan. It, yeah. was, it was definitely always the plan. But uh, that definitely helped. The precipitating uh, incident. Yeah. yeah it, it, it helped, like, you know, help me get back or – Okay. Piss or get off the pot kind of thing. Yeah. What do you think about, I mean, it's interesting that you're applying for grants because that's not typically a thing that is often available for stand-up precisely because it's kind of maligned art form. Mm-hmm. So what, what do you think about, uh, again, maybe this is sort of another way of asking the what is the role of c- comedy, but um, uh, should it be the kind of art form that is subsidized by the state in the same way that, say, Music is often subsidized by the state. Um, I, I, I think so. Yeah, it should. It should be. Uh, who knows about to the same extent? Because it, it, it really, m- they should have to be maybe a bit more discerning on who they give grants to or whatever, or, or who the who the who they're subsidizing. Because not everyone is going to be worth subsidizing. But that's going to be the same in any in any in any art form. I mean, it, um, yeah. it's it's. The the issue with the whole comedy not being recognized as an art form for grants and stuff like that by the by the government, uh, the big issue with that is it's just a stupid technicality. It's it's like I can write the same I can write a proposal for a stand up show, get it denied because it's stand up, but I could write it the same way as a one at one man play, and yeah. get funded. Yes. And why? What's the point of just changing that wording? Right. I mean, you could argue like, well, if it's only a matter of changing the wording, why why not just do it? But like, it's also kind of a matter of principle. It's a matter of principle, and it and it's a different thing. I mean, the yeah. one the one person show is a different thing from the stand up show because, in many ways, what you are being paid to do is create a script, and mm-hmm. stand up doesn't quite work on the level of script in that way. Yeah, yeah. Anything and, can happen in a stand up show. And the yeah, and and the writing process is different. You basically write on stage in shitty venues where people are, are talking loudly and, and you're not, you know, going away to a writer's colony and you know, sitting in a garret and, you know, with a double espresso pour over and, and, and sitting down and writing. It's, it's a vernacular art form where the practice and the, takes place in vernacular settings. Yeah. And so um, I think that's one of the, the, the difficult arguments about stand-up is... is I mean, I think one of the – is wrapping the head around that. Who gets paid? Because there are subsidies for stand-up, but they're often for promoters or like uh, – I mean, you know, again, rest in peace, JFL. But they got a lot of money from uh, tourism and heritage, not from the arts. Mm-hmm. Um, they uh, – you know, so festivals can get – can be sources for money. But that is it's – the, it's the festival. It's the venue that's getting the money. It's not the artists themselves directly. Mm-hmm. And and like I will say that the grants that I've that I've uh, you know received have been through like the Mi'kmaq Arts Program mm-hmm. with Arts Nova Scotia. Uh, so there's that aspect of like 
they're funding me almost because I'm indigenous and like in in my proposals like I I do use stand up I, I I do say yeah. stand up but I also say that stand up is rooted in storytelling and storytelling is very much like a big part of indigenous culture right. so I think I think that that really helps with the grants it does but you you're <laughs> almost redefining stand up not redefining stand up but it's like let me put this into your terms and yeah. things like so yeah and, yeah. and that's that's all grant writing really ever is, is that's true is figuring out what they want to hear and <laughs> yeah and the secret that. is that many people just want to give the money away because that's that's the purpose they, they, just, they have it to give away so yeah they just need to hear a good reason for it so mm -hmm. yeah are there any f final thoughts that you would like to leave this wonderful audience with final thoughts um oh man i i, I had one a moment ago and then it's it's gone we were talking about art. We were talking about uh, the, the, the grants. We were talking about things. We were talking about genitals for a while there. Oh, that's that's what I was. <laughs> okay. That's what, no. Um, oh man, there was there was something that I wanted to that I wanted to bring up. Uh, it was before we. Oh, it, this is just like more of an anecdotal kind of thing. But uh, when you were bringing up the local celebrity thing and the they. Um, I and, and and opportunities that came through comedy. Um, I'm a huge fan of Joe Para. I don't know if you ever heard of Joe Para. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a stand-up comic. He had a show on Adult Swim called Joe Para Talks Talks to You, um, which was which was fantastic. I'm a huge fan of him. Me and my friends are huge fans, and we were going down to the states to go see him live. So I just sent an email mm -hmm. to Joe Para, and I was just like, "Hey, I'm a comic too, coming to the show." Uh, be cool if I open for you. Mm -hmm. And he was like, sure, sure. Um, and like, this was the first time I've worked with plenty of fantastic comics, mm -hmm. you know, but this was the first time that I've ever worked with someone that I was an active fan of before working with them. Uh, like, you know, I, I, I've worked with like John Doerr, mm -hmm. but like, I didn't really know John Doerr before I worked with him. Yeah. But like, after working with him, it's like, wow, this guy is great. And like, he's got so much. Uh, like mm -hmm. such a great pedigree and stuff. Um, but I was literally going to that show as a fan and then to be on the lineup and then just to walk into the green room with this guy that I'm a fan of and just be a person yeah. with him was, was so cool. And then after the show, like his fans that were there to see him were asking me to sign like his merch. Oh. Uh, they, were, they, like, they were like, oh, I got this hat, you know, the, yeah. Joe Perra's hat. Can you sign it? And I was like, you sure? Like I'm a nobody. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, you were part of this show and this was a great show. And I was like, thank you. Like it, it was, it was, it was a lot of, it was really cool. And it like, 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 like I said, that, that, that aspect of, of being a fan, but then, then going from fan to colleague. Yeah. Uh, was like a big moment in like me feeling like, holy shit, I'm actually doing this. I, I've experienced that. I mean, I think academics have probably experienced that where there, there are people that, whose works that you read mm -hmm. in, in, in undergrad even, and then all of a sudden you're in a panel with them and, yeah. and they are talking nicely about you. And that's a, you, 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 we've all experienced that, I think. So it, 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 it but it's interesting. It's, it's the entry way into sort of the professional class, mm -hmm. what you're doing. And you, you know, I still, I, I still am verklempt when someone who I've read has actually heard of me, but, uh, it's it's a nice feeling, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's 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 great. Yeah, savor that. Thank you very much. Thank Clifton you, Clifton Creamer, everybody.